Alright, um, Hyatt, I've spoken a couple of times on salvation. Back in the fall, um, did a couple of presentations talking about the difference between sort of an organic versus a forensic view of salvation. How the Orthodox Church is much more sort of organic, we're talking about life and death, rather than guilt and innocence, forgiven, just, unjust. I've also talked about how you can look at salvation as a process of several steps of justification, sanctification, and glorification. And how orthodoxy focuses upon primarily the sanctification. We are justified in our baptism. Now, what are we doing to become like Christ in us? Rather than repeating myself, I thought I'd try to take a different approach tonight. Um, thinking about salvation and how we understand the world. What does salvation change? There's um, our Saturday morning Bible study. We've been going through the book of Romans fairly slowly. And we're hitting chapter 8. And chapter 8 is sort of a pivotal chapter. Because Paul, up until now, has been doing this long series of arguments about how the law does not save. Having, possessing the Mosaic Law does not save Israel. If anything, the law condemns. The law points out sin and points out our failings. And to Paul, this is a positive statement. Because it means everyone is equally caught up in sin and death. And therefore God can offer salvation to the whole world. Not just to the Jews to whom the law was given. He's laying out this argument, um, verse 724. What a miserable person I am. Who is going to rescue me from the body of this death? Thank God through Jesus our King and Lord. So then, le left to my own self, I'm enslaved to God's law with my mind, but to sin's law with my human flesh. He has salvation, but there's still this struggle going on. It is not something happens and it's all birds and butterflies and everything's great. There's a continuing struggle. And what I think Paul is dealing with is there's a mindset that has to be acquired. A way that we think, the way we approach the world, the way, way, way we approach reality. If you look back at a lot of the disciples, there is a common worldview. And these days it's especially coming forward, but it's really, you can find it all the way through history. That the world is basically a nasty place built on power. Look at Pilate, look at the Romans. Pax Romana, Rome gives us peace. But if you go against us, we'll put you in place with nails if necessary. <coughs> Control and power are the ultimate issue. If you look at Mark 10.35, Peter and James come to Jesus. We have a request of you. Will you come into your kingdom? Can we sit on your right and left hand? They're thinking politics. Think of politicians. Think of our presidents. Who's always maneuvering to be on the inside group with them? Who's going to be able to get power and authority in what they do? And Peter and James understand that reality, as it's assumed to be, of how the world works, and are wanting their proper place in this. You look at Luke, the road to Emmaus. Again, they're caught up in a mindset. At the time of Christ, there's already been several Messiah figures, and there are more to come. And every single time, a dead Messiah is a failed Messiah. And this is what the disciples on the road to Emmaus know, according to the world. 
we thought this was the Messiah. He was a prophet, but he's dead. Therefore, he can't be the Messiah we are looking for, who's going to free us from Rome, overthrow the powers. And Jesus comes along and changes their mindset, their worldview. And that's what Paul's talking about here in chapter 8. In a sense, metaphysics change things. The resurrection changes everything. The resurrection, it is not something we can prove analytically. It's a one-off event, absolutely unique in history. Never repeated, never before. And Paul's laying out that this is not a transaction. It's not just an exchange, something happened. But this is a relationship. So therefore, there's no condemnation for those in the Messiah Jesus. Why not? Because the law of the spirit of life in the Messiah Jesus released you from the law of sin and death. There is a transaction. There's a releasing from sin and death. But it's in Christ. For those of you in the Messiah, it is not just a something done out there, but the resurrection and our baptism, because Paul is writing to the church in Rome, those who have been baptized, but are still struggling to what does this mean. They say that this is a relationship of being in Christ, metaphysically. We are not isolated individuals, as our modern culture thinks where we stand alone. But having been baptized, we are in Christ. We are different. <coughs> There's a lot of what this is not. It's not just a rational change. Where I think about it, I know this happened, but it was out there, back then. It's not an emotional change. There's a song that's in a sense horrible, but it's a popular hymn in some circle. Uh, I know that Jesus lives because he lives within my heart. He's alive, I believe, because of emotional feeling. Paul is saying this is a fact. It's a historical something that happened that changes everything. There's an emotional side to it. It's how do we feel about this? But the reality is the reality of the resurrection. That this has changed everything, and through our baptism, we are found in Christ. But it's not something that is complete yet. And so we have to find out how do we think about this to live in the current time. And Paul is dealing with two mindsets. And the mindset that Paul is going to have us to get into is the view through the resurrection of how it changes everything. He's going on about all these positive things that are going on. And then he comes up with this strange statement. All who are led by the Spirit of God, you see, are God's children. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery, did you, to go back again into a state of fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, which we call out Abba Father. And then he says, and if we're children, we're also heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with the Messiah. You put the period there, this sounds great. But then he continues, as long as we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This is what Christ went through. Christ suffered the crucifixion to rise in glory. And in some of the theology that we have, we talk about Christos Victor. Christ the victor, who reigns from the cross. In the Roman mentality, in the normal mentality that we get caught up in. 
The cross is the absolute statement of failure. Rome, in its traditional view of power, asserts themselves on those who get in their way, who buck the trend, who don't follow their agenda, and we get rid of you. And Paul, in a paradoxical way, is saying that which they think is the ultimate humiliation and sign of failure in the conquering of Rome, Paul and Christ are saying this is the victory. It's at this moment that the victory takes place. And if we are in Christ, then we must go through the same victory, the same process. To experience the glory that God will give, we must also be willing to suffer through it too. And it's, it's a concept of hope. Hope is something that it's not here yet. I, I think of um, if you've ever waited for the subway or waited for a bus or a train. Every couple of minutes you're looking down the tracks. Is it here yet? That is, in a sense, is what we are. We're, we're living in hope. We trust in the resurrection, but we don't necessarily see it yet. We believe it because Christ is risen. This has happened. And we are now a part of this, but we don't see it. We see, oftentimes, more the suffering, the frustrations, the other things going on. And Paul is saying it is not we psych ourselves up emotionally, but we live in a hope and anticipation. And that gives us the steady endurance to keep going. Chapter 8, in some ways, is one of the most problematic chapters for a lot of places. Because Paul is constantly talking about flesh and the spirit. But you're not people of the flesh, you're people of the spirit. And it's, mes it's easy to misunderstand this. Of, um, it's quite common to believe that I look forward to dying when I'm going to go to heaven. This is not the Christian view. This is an old platonic view. That the flesh is bad. And our goal is to be liberated from Paul is dealing with these as two mindsets. as a fleshly mindset and a spiritual mindset. They're both within the same body and the same mind. The fleshly mindset is this thinking like the world. The way Peter and Paul were thinking when they were first apostles. That thinking like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He's a dead Messiah, therefore he's really not the Messiah. The spirit, as Paul is using this, is that resurrection mentality. That we see things through the eyes of the resurrection and how that changes. I say that it is not literally spirit and flesh. Because if it was this escape from the flesh, escape from the body, Paul wouldn't be saying some of the things he does here. In verse 19, yes, creation itself is on tiptoe with expectation, eagerly awaiting the moment when God's children will be revealed. Creation, you see, was subjected to pointless futility, not of its own volition, but because of the one who placed it in the subjection, in the hope that creation itself will be freed from its slavery of decay to enjoy the freedom that comes when God's children are glorified. It is not just a spiritual hope, but the whole creation. I, I like these words that sort of Paul used. It's, it's on tiptoe. You know, think of little kids you know, looking into a, um, a case of candy or 
going to Baskin Robbins and looking at all the ice cream. They're sitting there in anticipation and hope of something to come. And Paul is saying it is the whole creation. This building, this land around us, all of this is caught up in the same thing. Only it knows the resurrection has taken place. The creation has that mentality of hope. And we're to join with that creation in that mentality. It's interesting to look at the way the word groaning is used throughout this chapter. In verse 22, let me explain. We know that the entire creation is groaning together and going through labored pains together up until the present time. Deliberately using the imagery of giving birth, a birth of a new creation, but it's like during the pregnancy, it's an anticipation. It's not here yet, as much as you wish it would sometimes. And it's going to go through a labor pain to get there. But it's an anticipation of something coming along with it. In 23, not only so, but we too, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, life within us, are groaning within ourselves as we eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. The resurrection. It is not all glorious. It's a groaning. But then he ends up tagging on to this. In the same way, too, the Spirit comes alongside and helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray for as we ought to. But the same Spirit pleads on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. It is not God sitting up here watching us suffer down here. It is God participating in this process. The Spirit participating in this. Bringing about our salvation and the salvation of the whole creation. Paul ends up with some interesting, somewhat difficult words. In verse 28, we know in fact that God works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. He says this just after he's talking about all this groaning. All things work together for good. This is, the under, this is part of the understanding. It's not saying that these things are enjoyable and good in that way, but all things work together for good. <coughs> Think of the crucifixion. By all appearances and all views of the world, this is horrible and pointless and, me and makes life meaningless. But God is in a sense saying that it's through the crucifixion that death and sin were destroyed. We have been freed from that. We are dead to sin in Christ to be alive <coughs> with him. But it's a hope, it's an anticipation of what's to come. This is not living as if. Of um, You get some people who, yeah, life is ugly and horrible, but be nice anyhow. We live as if because things have changed. We are living in adoption. We're living as heirs of Christ. This is not a hope in the sense of, I hope the Easter Bunny brings me a lot of candy. This is a hope grounded in history, in the reality of the resurrection. Paul in other places talks about the spiritual experience and that experiential side of the faith. But he's talking to the Romans, he's getting them much more grounded realistically that we don't all have those experiences. <coughs> we don't all have those warm, fuzzy feelings. And 
and even those who have them don't have them all the time. And there is sort of a hard part of Christianity that Paul is saying it is a life of hope that we'll have suffering. But he ends up the chapter. Who shall separate us from the Messiah's love? Suffering or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As the Bible says, because of, because of you, we are all being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep destined for the slaughter. That's how the world sees us. No, in all these things we are completely victorious through the one who loved us. I am persecuted, you see, I am persuaded, you see, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor present nor the future nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in King Jesus, our Lord. Thoughts, reactions? So we don't have to be uh, ecstatic, joyous, you know, off the charts emotionally. It, we're just not like that most of the time. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are, and thank God for them. But this is grounded in a realistic knowledge. Christ has been resurrected from the dead. That's as good of history as you're going to get. And because of that, there are implications. We're heirs of God, we're children of God, and we have the hope of our own resurrection. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.